our apostles around today. Acts 1, 21. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So this was when Judas committed suicide and they needed another one apostle to replace him. Okay, so they're saying that it should be someone who was living among us, who witnessed Jesus in person. Then we see 1 Corinthians 9, 1, Paul says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? And so a lot of people have the doctrine that apostles do, are not around today because an apostle must have seen Jesus in person. They say this because of these scriptures. Well, let's go on and find more scriptures about apostles. Ephesians 4, 11. These are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. Apostles. And these gifts were given after Jesus ascended, okay? After he ascended, he then gave gifts. So this is after the time of him commissioning the 12 disciples. This is he is crucified, resurrected, poured his Holy Spirit to the church, and he gave gifts to the church. Apostles are one of them, one of the five. It then says, verse 13, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Passion Translation says, these grace ministries will function until we all attain oneness into the faith, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the Son of God, until we, and finally become one in, into a perfect man with full dimensions of spiritual maturity, fully developed into the abundance of Christ. So in other words, this equipping of the fivefold ministries, including the apostles, will continue until the bride has been perfectly prepared and Jesus has returned. We also see Romans 16, Seven. This is the Passion Translation. Paul is saying, make sure, make sure that my relatives are Dronicus and Junia that's a woman, are honored for they're my fellow captives who bear the distinctive mark of being outstanding and well-known apostles. So Adronicus and Junia, which is a woman, are well-known apostles. There we have another example of a woman in leadership. These people, Adronicus and Junia, they were after the time of Jesus being there on the earth. So we see there's apostles after who had not witnessed Jesus in person. 1 Thessalonians 2.6, we, which is Paul, Timothy, and Silas, it says in the Bible. In one of the translations, it says, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, we were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. So Timothy and Silas were also not the original 12, ones that had seen Jesus in person. The next generation. So there was a next generation of apostles being raised up under Paul's ministry, under the other apostles' ministries. So here we have these con contradicting scriptures. So, well, for one, we already find that there's way more scriptures that show that God wants apostles to be around till Jesus returns. What's God's heart? Well, it doesn't really make sense why God would want to get rid of apostles when he says that this is in the, the foundation of the church with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. And this important equipping is necessary. All five of these ministries are necessary for the body of Christ to be fully equipped. Okay, that's God's heart. And now we're going to look at context. These first couple of scriptures that say that the disciples are saying, we need to find someone to replace Judas. One of these must come become a witness with us of his resurrection. This was just the wisdom they were using at that time. Might as well choose someone who actually witnessed Jesus. They'll probably be stronger in faith than those who didn't actually witness Jesus. This is brand new gospel here. It'll, it's more likely that people who were really with the apostles in the beginning saw Jesus, that they'll be stronger in faith. Just at that time, it was just in that season. That makes sense. And Paul says, I saw Jesus. But when he saw Jesus, it was actually Jesus rebuking him. It wasn't, you're so amazing. And I am anointing you today as my apostle. When Paul saw Jesus, it was Jesus rebuking him for persecuting him through the disciples, murdering his disciples. So he shut his eyes. It wasn't like he really even got to see much. He shut his eyes. And then he said, go to my servant and he'll tell you what to do. So this a servant opened up his eyes. A minister an apostle opened up his eyes. God used an apostle to open up his eyes. And then he began ministering shortly after that. A lot of people have this doctrine that they, they think that apostles are being prideful or something. Like, you didn't see Jesus! Saying, I saw Jesus, but the real meaning is I saw spiritually. Our faith is ba it's not based on sight. It's based on spiritual sight. That's faith. Apostles must be called by Jesus. And they see Jesus in the spiritual realm and God calls them. Sometimes that can come through a prophet prophesying. Prophesying. 
but they've seen Jesus through that encounter. So then we can hear God's voice and conclude that apostles, God is using them today and will continue to use them. And that the requirements are that they are truly called by Jesus and have seen him in the spiritual realm. The requirement isn't having to see him physically. That may happen sometimes, but that's not a requirement. And I want to say something that might shock you. And I've watched you for a long time. And, and everyone I see you will say, she's like Catherine Coleman. They all say that. But I saw two books. And I saw a folder. It has Catherine Coleman. But I thought that was a book that would be open. But I saw another folder that had Amy McMaster. That was the book that was open for you. And the Lord says, Jenny, build Jenny. I see the books in your belly. And the first book you wrote is Apostolic Women Arise. It is coming straight. And the Lord says, the nations will open to you, Jenny. And they will say, who is this one that has risen from the West? Then I shall establish my covenant, Jenny, before the foundations of the world. I shall gather them from the West. They shall come from the East. They shall shout from the south, and they shall stand in the north. I shall fulfill my covenant journey. The time has come upon you to walk in the mantle of the apostle. Jenny, this is your story. Jenny, this is your time. Jenny, walk, walk, walk. The gates are open. Walk as an apostle, the nations are open. Walk, Jenny, walk. Walk, Jenny, walk. The season is now. But that's not all. For I shall cause you to give hope to the rest. Through your hands, I shall wrought miracles, signs, and wonders. And everyone thinks you are known for deliverance. But God said there was a new mantle of healing coming upon you. I see you lay hands on the sick people and their demons left them. There was a mantle of healing that is coming upon you. You shall lay your hands and those that are sick will come out stronger. Jenny calls you. Your day has come. You shall move in miracles. You shall move in signs. Move in wonders. This is your day, Jenny, arise, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. I end with this. Finally, the Lord will cast you to be one of the most sought after recovery consultants. Recovery consultant. The Lord says that that prison ministry, when they come out of prison, the Lord says, prepare the curriculums. I hear the Lord say that you will establish a recovery program. Those that have been out from prison, they will say, we want to enroll and be trained. I call you an extraordinary one. Jenny, I'm not speaking about America only. I hear South America. It's about to bust open. Your voice is raging in Germany. The Lord said, Munich. Yeah, Jenny, Munich. The nation is calling upon you. Northern Ireland. The Lord says, Jenny, your name is mentioned. United Kingdom. Hear the word of the Lord. All the way to Africa. I hear Zambia. I hear South Africa. I hear Zimbabwe. The nations are open. Jenny, rise, Jenny, rise. Today's topic is dealing with the teaching of female apostles today. 
And I wanted to play these first two clips, and we're going to be focusing really more so on the teaching that uh, recently Catherine Crick did in Sydney, Australia, and touching on some things. And I'm going to be directing you, as I usually do, some to some helpful resources that are um, good sources that will help us get a better understanding on this topic. But the clip that you just heard came from Catherine Crick's YouTube channel, and I played the full clip, but it was spliced up from a service apparently that she did fairly recently, and it looks like uh, at her, the church that she claims to oversee, 5F Church. And in that, you heard her mention several scriptures, and she twisted them to come to the conclusion that true apostles don't have to physically see Jesus, even though Bible scholars seem to agree with that matter that they do, and so they would disagree with Catherine Crick. But she concludes and draws out this teaching and this belief to people that there are modern day apostles, and she wants to drive the point home about Junia, which we're going to touch on that today, and listen to um, one teaching on that and, and talk a little bit about that as well, a few resources. But she comes to the conclusion and wants others to come to the conclusion that Apostles really didn't see Jesus physically. They had to see him spiritually. And so she's moving the goalposts in order for her to be called an apostle and for her to have governing authority, which she seems to believe in, as we will find today in the clips that we're going to evaluate from her recent teaching in, at Hillsong Convention in Sydney, Australia. So there's that. She she's teaching that 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 now you don't ha- they don't have to have the prerequisite of physically walking with Jesus's ministry, and she even um, seems to mock uh, the casting of lots, which God decided based on the casting of lots who would fu- who would fill Judas's position. And I would encourage you to read Acts one in its context, and do not read the Passion Translation. That would be my strong suggestion to you, because she read from the Passion Translation, which is not a translation at all. The second clip I played for you came from a service fairly recently, where there was a commissioning service for several people at a conference in Florida called Preach, Pray, Prophesy that Ryan Lestrange oversaw. There were a few others that were commissioned as uh, prophets, but most of them were commissioned as apostles. And one of those individuals was Jenny Weaver, who I've covered before, and I'll have a link to a podcast below that I've covered about um, the the core group. So you can feel free to look at that and uh, evaluate that for yourself based on what was shared. But at any rate, she is being commissioned as an apostle, and she has been given a long drawn out prophetic word. And if you pay attention to the things that are said to her, they're actually kind of disturbing because. Some of the things, if you're really listening, you can hear bits and pieces of scripture from the book of Isaiah, such as, I will fulfill my covenant. Um, And that's referring to Christ. Uh, Isaiah 5410 talks about that. Um, Arise and shine for the glory of the Lord is upon you. That's Isaiah 60. Um, There's a reference that she will give rest to the weary and that she's going to, that God's going to fulfill his covenant through her. These are all things that are about Christ, not about her. And even that her her name would be heard is being spoken in some of these nations and these countries. And I, I would argue that it should be Christ's name that should be proclaimed, that the focus um, should be on Christ. True prophecy is Christ-centered. It's not man-centered. Now, I would hope that there would be people that would be ministered to through prison ministry and and other things. They would hear the actual gospel in accordance with scripture. But it's concerning when you see these ministries that are giving these prophetic words and they're focusing on the person and being called an apostle or a prophet, the esteem that comes with that and all the great exploits they're going to do. But you're not going to hear much of the gospel being ministered, and you're not going to hear any of the gospel being ministered today when we evaluate Catherine Crick's teaching today. So we're going to dive into this topic. I know that it can be controversial for people because of their position and their their beliefs as far as how women should hold positions in the church. And this is not to say that women can't do things, but there are boundaries that are set within Scripture. And if we're going to tell people to go back to Scripture, then we need to tell them to go to the verses in the proper context. We need to be at peace with what God has spoken in His Word. So, Join me as we continue on with this topic today of female apostles, and we hear what Catherine Crick has to say, and even more than that, we hear what the Bible has to say, and see if it agrees with what Catherine Crick is saying. 
Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. Revival is now. That is the catchphrase that Catherine Crick likes to use when she's coming to these different events to minister and claim to do deliverances, healings, and salvations. Now, I'm on her itinerary page on 5fchurch.org where it shares her revival schedule. In October 5th and 6th of 2023, she traveled to Sydney, Australia to hold a Revival is Now Sydney, Australia conference where she was invited. And on this description, of this event, it says, get ready for an unforgettable two nights of powerful deliverance and healing meeting with Apostle Catherine Crick. Come expecting your miracle and impartation of the anointing from Jesus Christ. Early bird ticket discount until August 31st. When I clicked on that, because it had already passed, there was no information to let me know what the uh, cost of the event was, but it says tickets are to help with the expense of the venue and putting this event, event together. The tickets cost costs will increase on September 1st, and it was held at the Hillsong Convention Center in Balcom Hills of Australia. So I want to look at this today, just wanted to provide that information to you, and I'm going to summarize quite a bit of what happened. I'm going to share as, as I normally do with these, because I did watch the video. We're going to listen to key clips that I, I found very interesting and relevant to our discussion today about apostles, let alone female apostles. And she has several videos out about apostles. As I just said, I played a, a clip from her 5F church that was spliced together by their ministry, not me, telling about apostles and if they're needed today. And in this particular gathering that was held on October 5th, she comes out. And when I say this, I'm not trying to be mean or disrespectful. But I will say this, when she comes out, she's yelling and being very high energy and you know, saying revival is now Sydney, Australia. And it just seems more like um, a gathering for a motivational speech or I've never seen a TED talk. I've heard of them. So I don't know if it was if it, <laughs> if somebody's seen one of those, if it was something like that. But it just had that kind of vibe to it or energy to it. Oh, Thank you, Jesus. And in the first, I mean, it started five hours in, uh, the video did. Now, to, to be fair, the first several hours, it was just announcements playing at the beginning. Very long, the first three hours of that. So I had to go in about five hours and nine minutes in to even hear the message after the worship. And she talked about herself a lot during the first, I want to say, 20 to 30 minutes of this of this message. There was barely any scripture that was mentioned. And then when it was mentioned, I, I got to say, it was not spoken in its context and she's adding to it just like she did in the beginning of the first clip we heard when she said she she's concluding that the apostles don't now have to see uh, Jesus physically and walk with him in his physical earthly ministry in order to be apostle now you just have to see him spiritually so anybody could be an apostle now there's there's no requirements for that so the goalpost has been moved everybody Anyway, about five hours into this video, the message began, and she tells people of being called as an apostle and that people will be healed and delivered in this meeting. So she's going to set the framework and set the atmosphere already, for lack of better words, that there's an apostle there in front of them, and they're coming to receive the anointing. She wrote a book. I mean, I'm telling you, that the, even the end of it, the way it closed, she said, there's going to be a book signing at the end, and if you want to come speak to me, and there's going to be an impartation service tomorrow morning, which... I attended, not hers, but I attended many impartation services over the 18 years. <laughs> I, was, I was part of this type of movement and belief system. And these are big things that the, the leaders like to do. And, they, and quite frankly, it's, it's as if they think a lot of themselves. They want to impart what they believe they have to the masses that are attending there. But she tells them this and, and, and tells this the long drawn out story of her becoming an apostle. Now she leaves out some details and there's some things that other people have covered in the past that I'm not going to touch on because there are some 
major concerns about the man she calls her spiritual father, who's a prophet in Africa, that ministered over her as an apostle. There are clips that have been taken down over the past couple of years showing some of the things that she said, and, and some of um, she's tried to clean some of that up. But at any rate, she has a spiritual father. There was a prophet that spoke over her uh, four and a half years ago, I believe she said, in Los Angeles. And she said she never wanted to minister, but she wanted to be a pop singer. Uh, there's also a Videos out too. She was an, an actress. You can find these things. She was on some reality shows. She's on a commercial. Uh, there's different things that you can find that's out there that you may not even know about. Um, and we all have things in our past. So that's not to uh, disparage her in any way, shape, or fashion. But just letting you know, she said she did not want to be a minister. She wanted to be a pop singer. So she's done music videos, and she was an actress. She wanted God's will and surrendered her life, um, and she knew that it was God speaking, she said, when this prophet, Jor Davey, said these things to her. She just knew, because she said in, in other testimonies, she's also stated that she was a Christian all of her life, and that's not true. Nobody has been a Christian all of their life. Uh, nine months after the prophetic word, she said she began a church in Los Angeles called 5F. Now, I'm going to be saying some things, and as I go, there's probably going to be some warning bells going off, and you're going to be immediately maybe thinking of some scripture that would um, <laughs> disagree with what she's doing, <laughs> but I'm just sharing these details with you, and then we'll play some clips as we go. She tells stories about herself and that she didn't have much of a following at that time on social media. She released a story on TikTok that went viral. She said people were healed through that video. It's what she's alleging. And she tells of the word spreading about her. And again, I'm just going to say this seemed very focused on her. Uh, it took quite a while for her to even get to a scriptural passage. If you're just looking to see, okay, when is the word going to be ministered? When are people actually going to be fed the word in a proper way or any mention of any Bible verses at all? This is the observations I'm making uh, that we're still talking about her at this point. And so I'm waiting for the word of God to be stated at some point, And it yet has been. She continues to tell how her ministry grew. And she says it was revival. That's what she's claiming. She says that God has increased his anointing. And she shares this to give the rhema word, she says, which is revival is now. Many of us have heard that term. Um, that's referring to the spoken word of God. That's mentioned. It's a Greek word that's in the New Testament. And I've talked about that before in another episode. So you can listen to that because people will focus on the difference between logos and rhema. But she wants to inspire people with her story that they will want what she has and see revival break out as it has in Los Angeles. And I'm using words that she used. So now we're about five hours and 26 minutes into this video. So we started out at five hours, nine minutes, <laughs> just giving you some reference points. And I want to play this clip for you because she says God has sent her there as an apostle to release the anointing. I want to see my ministry carry the anointing and be a place, a well where people flock to, to encounter Jesus, the yoke destroyer, the healer of all healers. Hallelujah. This is the message that God has for you today. It's here. Receive it. Don't miss it. God has called me as an apostle to declare this to you. This is for you. God has sent me here to release this anointing to you. Not only to release healing and deliverance to you, but to release impartation of anointing to you so that what is happening in my ministry will begin to happen in your ministry. That's the kingdom way. Freely you have received, so freely give. If you actually watch this video, you're going to notice that there's a, an emphasis on this, that she's an apostle. She's coming with authority. She's going to continue to lay this out as we see. And there is a heavy focus on healings and deliverance, but there's no gospel. There's no call of salvation. There's no call of repent and believe in the gospel. There is the call to repent and believe in her message, essentially, when you listen to it. There's that undercurrent there. If you're not childlike, as we'll hear, if you're not childlike and receiving the new revelation, 
to where God can open your eyes and you can get rid of that old wine skin and receive the new, then you're just not going to be able to participate in this. This sounds vaguely familiar to me. Uh, it sounds like something that the things that C. Peter Wagner talked about in the in, when I was doing some research on this and doing an episode on uh, the the NAR conspiracy theory and, and things that people were talking about, uh, that it was uh, dedicated to the NAR deniers. She goes on to say that she wants to give them keys to receive revival, that there are principles that they need to follow. They have to be humble and accept revival God's way. And the very first scripture that we come to, she mentions, is at five hours and 30 minutes in, then it's Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And I want to read those to you. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And she also likes to read from the Passion Translation, as I said, which is not a translation. Uh, so if you have any th- questions about what I, or some thoughts that, that I found on that, which some people have done far more extensive research than I have, uh, I would encourage you to look into that if you are a proponent of the Passion Translation. But this is the first verse that she mentions uh, 30 minutes in after she's talked a lot about herself and people receiving her anointing. She then tells them about uh, that she wants to reveal the secret about her ministry. She said yes to his will. And that's the secret, she said. That's, that's the simple, simple secret. She said, yes, that the church is being purified and prepared. The bride is being purified. Uh, this, this stuff is not new revelation, by the way. This, these are things that have been said for years uh, in the latter rain movement and leading up to, to where we are today. Um, and she says, in order for the, this to happen, the purification, we have to find the church, how the church is to be in the book of Acts. And she says, it's about the fivefold. So here we go. The second verse that's mentioned is Ephesians 4.11. She said that people are weak because they are missing the equipping of the fivefold. And this is a little bit longer clip I want to play for you, uh, where she talks about apostles and prophets and the restoration, (laughs) I kid you not, she used that word restoration, of the apostles and prophets. It's like just being given a gift uh, (laughs) of here you go. This is all about the new apostolic reformation, just neatly packaged and put a big old bow on it, talking about this stuff. So five hours and 36 minutes in, this is what she said about apostles and prophets being necessary today in the church. And, and it reveals to us in this verse in Ephesians here that this fivefold ministry is needed for this equipping to take place. So this is a key right here of why we don't see the anointing by and large in the body of Christ, actually. What does she mean by that? I would ask, as you're listening to this, just ponder some of that. What, what does she mean by that? And I would say that she means we're not seeing all the healings and deliverances that we should be seeing in order for the anointing to go forth and for God to uh, do what he wants to do. So he's going to need apostles and prophets. I just want to interject that there. I may interject some as I go, as I have thoughts, but that is something that struck me. What does she mean by that? That's something I want you to think about and consider. Because we've gotten rid of the apostles and the prophets by and large. Ephesians 2.20 says that the foundation of the, of the body of Christ is the, are the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. That's speaking of living apostles and prophets. If we have living pastors today, it's, it's known that we need living pastors, right? We can't have dead pastors. We need living pastors. So we also need living apostles and prophets today to bring revelation, to bring the fresh word of God, to bring that equipping that the body needs. So that's seriously, I mean, many of you probably wonder what happened to the anointing. This is one of the big reasons. You know, coming out of this movement, I I have yet to think in the four years, four and a half years I've been out, to think, what happened to the anointing? I, I mean, I probably had those thoughts when I was in this movement, but I don't think that now because I'm actually reading the word of God. And (laughs) not to say that people that aren't charismatics, let me just say this, aren't reading the word and not all charismatics are part of the new apostolic reformation. I know I've made that clear before, but I just want to say that again. 
But I, I do want to say this as far as what she said. There is a big focus on the anointing. There's a big focus on apostles and prophets. They're not, she's not talking, and many of them that believe this are not talking about missionaries, by the way. That's not what they mean by that. They mean people with governing authority over the church. And she said, we need living apostles today to bring the fresh word, fresh word, fresh word. That's new revelation and equipping. And uh, I mean, a good study uh, would be good for your in your personal time on Ephesians to see the three areas where uh, apostles are mentioned and to see if maybe the question should be posed, does Paul change his mind about what he means by apostles from Ephesians 2.20, Ephesians 3.5, and Ephesians 4.11? Are that, is that a consistent meaning, or is he changing meanings? And some scholars will, may differ on that, but I think that's something to 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 consider when you're looking at Bible study in this, but I don't understand why the, that there's not the presentation that the word is living. I thought that the word of God was living and that it was sufficient for us. Are we not under apostolic teaching every time we read scripture? Because the apostles are still ministering to us through the word of God because God inspired them. This is a dual authorship of scripture. God used these men and not women, by the way. He used men, apostles of Christ, who had to see him in his earthly ministry, not spiritually. That's changing the wording. In Acts 1, we know that that is the the foundation of which they were chosen and that they were given the authority, delegated authority by Christ, who has all authority, all power and authority in heaven and on earth. They were delegated authority and they were authenticated in their ministry by signs and wonders and miracles to show, yes, indeed, these men are from Jesus Christ, from God himself. So are we not under apostolic teaching today every time we read scripture? Because she is making it seem, at least in my puny little mind, (laughs) she is making it seem like the word is just not enough, that these are dead apostles and we've done away with apostles. And just because some of us say this does not mean we've done away with apostles. No, that's quite the contrary. We've actually submitted ourselves to the apostolic teaching, which is scripture. Why do we need scripture if we need modern apostles today? Because, again, she's not talking about missionaries. She believes that she carries revelation, new revelation. So that would be on par with scripture, would it not? This, this whole double speak that goes on in this movement, it's, it's, it leads people, it's very confusing if you're not paying attention to what's being said and you're not wise um, to, to what is going on in all of this because they do not mean something lower than, than what they believe they are. They believe they have a governing authority. She's referring to scriptures referencing the apostles of Christ, as you're going to hear, uh, and, and as you heard in the very first clip that's apart from this convention. But let's keep going and finish to hear what she has to say in this area. Apostles, they're a, a big sign of an apostle actually is that they walk in signs, wonders, and miracles, Paul says. That's the one office where it specifically says that. And so if they're supposed to bring the equipping, if their specialty is walking in the power of God and we get rid of them, no wonder there's not much anointing. We need apostles and prophets to release this anointing of impartation because that's God's main way of releasing his anointing to his people, impartation, releasing it to vessels and that vessel releasing it to their spiritual children. Elijah to Elijah, Moses to Joshua, Paul to Timothy. So apostles and prophets are needed to release the impartation and they are needed to bring the meaty teaching and equipping of how to walk in the power of God, how to be victorious in your own life over the devil and and how to do the works yourselves to help other people, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to walk in God's power. Well, again, didn't the apostles of Christ already do that through the the written canon of Scripture? Had they not provided the information on how to uh, walk in victory as a believer, to focus on Christ, what the proclamation is supposed to be? I have yet to hear the, the gospel, yet to hear it. That is very problematic. And again, you listen to this entire message, the gospel is not presented. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that. It is not presented. And that is, um, th- this, this message is, is not a gospel message without a, without a gospel. This is a Christless message. 
This is a message about healing signs and wonders and using God in order for you to walk in anointing. How I began to, how I saw this promise fulfilled in my life, it began with just saying yes to God's new thing that he was doing. God's way of revival. In this revival, he's specifically pouring out apostles and prophets, restoring them into the body of Christ. And that's the, the way that this revival is coming. It's gonna be pioneered and, and led by apostles and prophets. Hallelujah. And so if we want revival our own way, the way, the way past revivals have been and, and, and not open to this new thing that God's doing, you can miss it. So many people are not used to seeing apostles and prophets today. So many people are quick to speak against and just call anyone false. But according to the scripture, it says that this equipping is going to continue until we are fully mature, fully built up. So that means that that equipping of the fivefold ministry with apostles and prophets included will continue until Jesus returns. So, so this is God's revival, God's way. Part of that is the fivefold ministry, the apostles and prophets. He's restoring now into the body of Christ. And so maybe you're not used to that. Maybe you're not used to apostles and prophets. Maybe the church you go to never mentions them or it really accepts them, but this is the word of God now. If you want to receive this anointing, if you want to be a part of this revival, you have to accept revival God's way. You have to accept his way of equipping his body. You have to accept his apostles and his prophets. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you ever heard somebody talk and they're explaining something to you and you think, well, you're explaining exactly what what you're talking about as far as the problem or you, the solution is right in front of you and you don't see it. And when I'm listening to this clip uh, again for the third time, I have that, that thought of it, it's right in front of you. It's called the word of God. That because she keeps saying, well, we need the apostles because it needs to carry on so that we can be matured. It's called scripture, Catherine. That's what we have is the word of God. God has left us with this and it is, it is complete. And it is a, the apostles ministering to us. The prophets are ministering to us through this word. And as I said last time in the last episode, there are some people that, that teach of a fourfold ministry because they combine, based on their understanding of um, the, the words and the Greek and such, that they understand that pastor and teacher go together. And so they say fourfold. So does that mean that, that, that they're not going to catch the move of God because they believe in the fourfold versus the fivefold? Anyway, I... Uh, I wanted to go on with this. She she continues on in the in the next verse that she mentions is the fourth verse that she mentions is Matthew eleven twenty five. She reads it from the Passion Translation. Red flag. I actually have a copy of the Passion Translation, and I don't use it. I have it for research purposes only. I I owned it before uh, I left the movement, but I just want to read to you what the Passion says. And then I want to read to you what the ESV says. The Passion says, Then Jesus exclaimed, Father, thank you for you are Lord, the supreme ruler over heaven and earth, and you have hidden the great revelation of your authority from those who are proud and wise in their own eyes. Instead, you have shared it with these who humble themselves. It's much longer. Um, I find myself, when I, in the past, I remember thumbing through my passion trying to get to a certain point, and I, and I remember thinking, man, it's taken a little bit longer than... <laughs> then I then it seems like it should to get to a certain verse, and that's because a lot of times the passages are longer than the actual translations that you see in reputable Bibles. Um, in the ESV, Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says, At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. 
Now, it would be good to do, again, a study on Matthew eleven twenty five and just look at the context before this, because uh, Jesus, at the beginning of Matthew 11, he's called by John the Baptist to when he's in prison because he wants to know if Jesus is the one that he's been proclaiming. Uh, when you get down to verse 20 in Matthew 11, you see that there is a woe to unrepentant cities right before Jesus says this verse in Matthew eleven twenty five, and referring to the fact when you look in some of the notes, um, some believe that he was speaking sarcastically in these words as the Jewish leaders were ironically identified as wise and prudent and the followers of Christ as the little children. Yet God had revealed to those followers the truth of the Messiah and his gospel. Again, the hidden mystery is the gospel. It's not any private revelation. It's not any new fresh word. It's the gospel. That was the mystery that was revealed. It has been revealed through Christ who came and he has fulfilled what he was meant to do in his earthly ministry. So she mentions this and she also mentions Mark 16, 15 through 18. Many of us in this movement heard that many times referring to that. I've talked about that before. Just look, just read it. Just read Matthew 16 and, and from, from the beginning to the end and follow the, the logical sequence of that verse and see who Jesus is talking to. That's all I'm going to say. She says true believers, not lukewarm believers, based on Mark 16, 15 through 18, will walk in these signs. She says that's what it means. She says we need God's power to move through us to carry fullness so people will have real encounters. Um, where is the gospel in this? <laughs> Again, I'm going I'm going to beat that drum. Where is the gospel in this? She says God's will for you and me is to carry the anointing. She has seen many people receive her anointing is what she says. And now we're five hours, 46 minutes in. And this is what Catherine Crick says about the anointing and who will receive it. It's not something you need to go to school for many years <laughs> to learn how to receive it. To receive the anointing is actually very simple. I've seen many people receive impartation of anointing through my ministry. I've seen people here, I see people here who have testified, even watching through the screen, how they began to see God moving power through them, casting out demons. Simple, powerful impartation. But it's not released to everyone, this anointing. It's simple to receive it. It's not complicated, but it's not released to everyone. It is only released to select people, chosen people. And what these people have in common, and what I've seen, these people that even that, that have testified of receiving impartation, all of them have one thing in common, and it's humility being pure in the heart, childlike, teachable, having a heart that just wants God's will, having no ulterior motives, other agendas, selfishness, but truly having this heart, Lord, it is my deepest desire to please you, to serve you, to obey you, so use me however you want. Use me to scrub toilets every day, all day, if that's what you want. Use me in the most uncomfortable places for me, <laughs> if that's what you want. But this heart of true surrender and humility and selflessness. I would agree that we are to walk in humility and that we are to serve. Uh, Jesus gives us that example in scripture and he gives us the command. He gives his disciples the command and we are given the command to serve all throughout the, the New Testament. But what she's saying here, if you're listening, is that the, the if you agree with what she's saying and what the apostles are saying today, those who claim to be apostles and they do, you don't question them, that if you if you humble yourself and you receive this new revelation, that you re that's how you receive the anointing is you be childlike and you receive. So you be naive and you receive what these people are saying. And she, she's re she references Jesus praying and thanking the Father for hiding it from the proud or wise. Again, she goes back to 11, Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, and she says this has to do with receiving the anointing. She says that verse has to do with receiving the anointing. 
I, I would like to guide you back to First John chapter 2, verse 20 through 27, when the Apostle John said this to fellow believers, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise that he made to us eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Friends, I'm going to be bold and make this statement. Catherine Crick is deceiving people. She is deceptive. Whether she realizes or not and is deceived herself, I don't know. But I will say this, she's telling you something that you don't need, that I don't need, because you know what? I just read 1 John 2, and you can read it out loud to yourself, and do you know what happens? You're under apostolic teaching. You just heard apostolic teaching that came straight from God himself. It was divinely inspired. It was God-breathed, according to 2 Timothy 3.16. You just heard apostolic teaching. What she's telling you is a bill of goods. Run away from it. She's not an apostle. And I will be so bold as to say that. And I will talk a little bit about this near the end and even share a video with you and may play a short clip from it that may help and provide some resources that may help also for you to better understand about apostles and even the, the whole hot topic about female apostles. And people are saying, well, p the women are trying to be shut down in ministry. No, there are boundaries that women are to stay within in ministry. God is clear in his word about that when we're when in a church service and what we are to do and apostles with governing authority in the church were apostles of Christ they had authority she does not she doesn't have any anointing that i want and i would encourage you not to even chase after that because it's deceptive she's not an apostle and she's deceiving people scripture makes it clear cuz god is clear when he speaks that we have all that we need in the Word of God for the anointing. We do not have any need that anybody should teach us about the anointing. And, and I would, again, as I normally do, I would encourage you even, look at the context of and the, the historical context of why John wrote this epistle, why he wrote it to the church and what was going on at that time in addressing the Antichrist spirit versus the one who gives eternal life, which that has the message of the gospel in it, by the way. <laughs> when she talks about uh, Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, that it has to do with receiving the anointing, ask yourself, is that what the text says? Wouldn't a true apostle know how to handle God's word? These are just things I want you to think, and maybe you have better questions than I do. Uh, but these are things I want you to consider. She says you have to be open to being taught new ways chapter and verse, please. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> chapter and verse that this verse has to deal with. You just need to have your eyes opened and to being taught new ways. And that this, this is how you receive the anointing from Matthew eleven twenty five. And then she even goes on about five hours and 50 minutes in and she references Matthew nine sixteen, which is the passage where Jesus is uh, talking to the disciples of John about the, the question about fasting. And they say to him, why do we and the fa Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus goes on to explain to them about the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, and the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. In verse 16, what she focuses on, which she says that this verse talks about not being critical and not uh, trying to understand the scripture, understand all the scripture the way you think it means, and using an old wineskin and thinking you know all about the word. She says that's what that's talking about. <laughs> And, and I'm going to say this once again. Th this is not new teaching. This is new apostolic reformation teaching. This is C. Peter Wagner type talk. This is Naranese that's, that's coming out of here. Old wineskin, new revelation. Uh, you need to, the religious spirit is tied to the old wineskin that when you, when you do some Bible study on this from some, some solid Bible teachers, you're going to find that they make a distinction between the old covenant, which the Pharisees were under and they were willing to, 
to stay in that versus the new covenant, which Christ brings. Um, he brings that he brought that new covenant and that they were just unwilling to receive him as the Messiah. They were unwilling to receive the, the covenant that he brings of salvation and redemption through through his uh, atonement on the cross. She's going to make it as. You know those people that are critical of of uh, modern day apostles and prophets. They're they're under an old wineskin. They have a religious spirit. They they think they know all about the word. And she's going to tell you that she has this new revelation and fresh revelation that you need to listen to. Mm, okay, about uh, almost five hours and fifty eight minutes in. A little shy of that. She says, if you don't have God's power in your life, which is miracle signs and wonders, then something is missing. And that means that there's an old wineskin and there's no new revelations. And this is Naranee's talk that she's that she's using. Um, as I said, nothing new under the sun with this. A little over six hours uh, in, she says, the spiritual principle is to humble yourself and God opens your eyes to receive new things. So what is the new wineskin would be a good question to ask uh, to get some more clarity from from the individuals that believe this. She ends, and it takes quite a while with this, she ends with an altar call for revival warriors. And about an hour in, she said, God wants to anoint you. And when you say yes, God will choose you. She says, God needs you. No, actually, God doesn't need us. God is self-sufficient. Uh, and that may be, some people may think that that's nitpicky saying that, but this whole rhetoric um, and, and these beliefs of, well, God needs me and he's pining away for me and he's just desperate for me. God does not need you and he does not need me. God is self-sufficient. Yes, he loves his people. He has a steadfast love and he is faithful. It doesn't mean that God is cold and that he doesn't care and he doesn't love with an everlasting love. But this whole thing of romanticizing Jesus in a way and making him some pining away boyfriend, that's not the case. God is self-sufficient and he does not need me. And I'm I'm reminded of my need for him, not the other way around. And I hope that you are the same while understanding that he is loving and he's faithful, he's kind, he's gentle, he's patient. He's also just and he's holy. And he's all these attributes in one, not like a pie cut up into pieces, but he is all these in one. We must not forget his justice and his wrath and his holiness while trying to romanticize God and romanticize this movement and make it seem like God is in need of us and that he can't do anything without us. That is a God of someone's own making, not the God of the Bible. She says it is time for the people to receive, and she begins to say people are needing deliverance. And she does a mass deliverance at one point, saying different things that she's rebuking and people coming up on stage. And it seems quite uh, interesting that she continues almost every time that she says, I break every generational curse. Apparently, the generational curses are a big thing, as I've talked about. A lot of the stuff I've talked about before, but it just bears repeating. Um, She says it is sin due to the spirit of addiction that that's why people are battling with sin. So here we go with this, the whole thing of people not being uh, accountable for their sinful nature and talking about sanctification as born again, believers, as true born again, believers, we're going to go and assign a spirit to everything, even though they say they don't do that, but yet they do it. Uh, She says that God is asking some to surrender their lives to Jesus along with this mass deliverance. This is what I want to say about that, as as listening to that. The apostles of Christ preached Christ and Him crucified. So wouldn't a true apostle do that? That that was nowhere in there. Christ and Him crucified was not mentioned. It was not preached. It was not proclaimed. It was was not, there was no uh, call of saying, you're a sinner, you're under the wrath of God. Um, If you don't know God, you have broken His laws, you are rebellious. Uh, but God in his rich in his mercy sent his son, um, even though you're a lawbreaker and then you're in rebellion against God, he sent his son to die on the cross for you and to atone for your sin. And the call is to repent and believe and put your trust in the saving faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ to uh, cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to give you the promise of eternal life. There, it, there was, it was a Christless message. 
And that sounds harsh to say, but when you have no Savior that's crucified for your sins, and all you want to focus on is healings, deliverance, miracle signs and wonders, and how you're an apostle, and you want to tell your testimony for the first 30 minutes of how you received this prophetic word, and how you were called to be an apostle, and you were you wanted to be a pop singer, and that and there's no message of the gospel in that anywhere, and you're directing people to you, that's a Christless message. And that's sad. There are many people in here clapping. And it again, it's it's almost like this motivational speech. And people are just clapping, like going along with it and not questioning, not asking. And there's nothing wrong with questions. But I'm telling you right now, people in this movement, the leaders in this movement, they will they will make it seem like if you question in the slightest, that's unwelcome and you don't have the Holy Spirit and you actually are in operation by another spirit if you question. Paul seemed to view things differently with the Bereans in Acts 17. I, I, he never c- accused them of having a demonic spirit, and he was an actual apostle. So, you know, all these decrees, declarations, healings, she tells people to receive decrees and things said by her that she talks about. She directs people to her YouTube to understand how to maintain deliverance. Uh, she gives them an opportunity to give financially at the end, and she says to give with revelation. And she's going to do an impartation and equipping service in the morning, the following morning, and a book signing. So all of this. I mean, it it was just very much, it was very... Uh, very discouraging to listen to it. And and you see the comments from people that are commenting on the YouTube video and on the live chat, and people are putting out fire emojis, and they're saying, oh, I was there, and the power of God was so, uh, was so tangible, and it was so heavy and powerful, and I believe I got delivered. And I, I feel so bad for these people. I have such compassion um, at the same time of righteous indignation for misrepresenting God's word and deceiving people and manipulating them. But I have such compassion at the same time because um, I, I don't want to ever forget from where I had fallen. Not in a condemning way, but I don't want to lose compassion to where I become cold and don't have, have enough love for people to warn them of the dangers of these false teachings. And that's why I do what I do. It's not because I'm a Pharisee or have a religious spirit. And I know that I can, as a human being, I can sin and err and, and, and cross over into being hypercritical, as we all can. That's not because of a demonic influence. That's because of sin. And I have to guard against that because of seeing these things because it's, it's, it's frustrating. It's difficult to see these things taking place and masses of people being so deceived and led astray and led away from the beauty and the majesty and the power and the glorious, pure truth of the Word of God. And, I do, and it's just, it's so hard because you, when you're someone that's come out of this and you're trying to warn people and you're trying to sound that alarm and you're trying to say, go back to the Word of God in the right context, go back to Scripture, please go back to the gospel. And you're seeing people that look like they're walking down a very wide, broad path. It's alarming and those that would listen that you you may not you may not agree with what i'm saying i want you to hear that i want you to hear this from a fallible person that still sins not habitually wanting to live a lifestyle like that but recognizing i still have a sinful nature to contend with and so do you i do have the indwelling of the holy spirit and I, my life has been richer over the past several years by looking and reading and studying His Word and coming to repentance and coming to understand sanctification and to understand that when I'm reading Scripture, I'm under apostolic teaching, and it's enough. I want to end uh, with referencing a few articles to you and then a short clip before we part ways today. But there are some resources that I'm going to share with you. There is an article by Dave Miller that was written several years ago. It's called, Are There Modern Day Apostles Today? I'm going to post the link in the description below. And I'm going to highly encourage that you read it because he goes through the qualifications of an apostle. He says uh, in his paper, when one assembles all the relevant New Testament data, at least three qualifications emerge as prerequisite to one becoming an apostle in the official sense. First, an apostle had to have seen the Lord and been an eyewitness of Christ's resurrection. This is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 22, Acts 22, 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Second, an apostle had to be specifically selected by the Lord or the Holy Spirit. The verses referenced are Matthew 10, 5, Mark 3. 13 through 14, 
Luke 6.13, Acts 1.26, Acts 9.15, Acts 22.14 and 15 and 21, and Acts 26.16. Miller says, Third, an apostle was invested with miraculous power to the extent that he could perform miracles. The power to perform miracles included the capability to confer the ability to work miracles to other individuals through the laying on of his hands. And there is a long list of verses that I won't read, but you can read this on your own time that he references for this third point. He says, Jesus referred to his bestowal of miraculous capability upon the apostles when he promised they would be endued with power from on high, Luke 24, 49. He goes on in this paper to talk about the work of an apostle. He, he uh, has a section called the original apostles were sufficient. <laughs> this is uh, referencing their, uh, their ability to write and their authority to write scripture. He uh, discusses about the duration of an apostle and that there are no apostles today. And he says, unfortunately, in that section, several groups that claim affiliation with the Christian religion allege to have apostles among them, including Catholicism, Mormonism, and some Pentecostal groups. This claim is unbiblical. No person living today can meet the qualifications given in Scripture for being an apostle. No one living today has been an eyewitness of Christ's resurrection. Christ has selected no one living today for the apostolic role. No one living today possesses the miraculous capabilities of an apostle. We should not be surprised that people would falsely claimed to be apostles, Jesus warned that false prophets would come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they would be ravening wolves. Matthew seven fifteen. Paul describes some of his opponents in these words, according to 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Miller states, further warning was issued to the Galatian churches, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1.8. Anyone claiming to be an apostle today who teaches anything in addition to the New Testament is clearly not an apostle of Christ. He says, Peter added his voice on the same subject, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Second Peter two, one. No wonder John admonished beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. First John four, one. So again, I would just encourage you to, to read this article. So I would highly suggest that you read this article. Um, It's very helpful, and I think that it will provide some insight to you. There are two other articles I want to share with you briefly before I get to the short clip I want to play for you, and I will post the link to the full video down below in the description of this episode. But on blueletterbible.org, which I have found to be a good resource to go to to do some Bible study, Don Stewart has an article that I will reference with regard to female apostles. And he asks the question, were there female apostles? I found this to be a really good read because he's referencing Romans 16 with the um, debate about Junia. And this is why I'm going to save this clip for last, because it, it uh, has to do with this. But he talks about, oh, were there female apostles? And he states that if there were female apostles, then it would be in the wider sense of the term apostle. The 12 disciples or apostles that Jesus originally chose were all male. However, in the term apostle is used in the New Testament for others apart from the 12. Therefore, it is not impossible that the wider circles of apostles included females. Uh, He says there are no clear examples of female apostles, however, in the New Testament. Um, Where apostles are mentioned, they are clearly male. But there is a verse that seems to be an exception to the rule, depending on who you talk to about this. So a debated, uh, I would dare say that some of the qualified biblical scholars would say this, that a, a debated passage such as Romans 16 when it's talking about Junia, that should not be used to create a doctrine that there are female apostles. But that's what's happened in this movement. And as you heard in the other clip, I played the the apostle uh, commissioning of uh, Jenny Weaver from the individual I was under, Ryan Lestrange, for years. I played that because I wanted to show you an example of what's going on because there is this push for that and this belief. And she believes she's an apostle and and people are calling her that now, Apostle Jenny. She's not an apostle. I pray that she would repent and come out of the deception that she's uh, putting th- hundreds of thousands of people under by her teachings, uh, especially these women and then their families. 
but she's not an apostle. Um, I, I would love for her to repent and and to to see her uh, walk away from from these teachings that she's doing, and to submit herself to the truth of Scripture to a good, solid Bible teaching church. And I would also even like to see her um, minister to to women that have been in situations like she has. I, I know that she probably has a passion for prison ministry and such. So I want to see God glorified in this. I want to see the gospel go forth. But there's a lot of deception that's going on here um, in the name of God. And we're not going back to Scripture in the right context, and then we're, we're essentially f- uh, fighting for things that the world's fighting for um, and against the, the patriarchy, if you will, and that's in Scripture and, and fighting for women's rights and, and pushing this whole thing and instead not being content with what God has spoken in His Word and the boundaries that He said and the order that, he's, that He created, even from the beginning of the order that He created. Uh, so, uh, Don Stewart talks about, was Junia an, an apostle, a female apostle? He mentions about the, the debate of this was, if this was male or female, if this person was based on the, the use of the Greek word. He touches on the Bible translations differ as to whether uh, this was a male or female. So, there's that debate. Uh, he says that Julia is a variant reading in the text. He said there may be one of th- uh, they may be one of three husband and wife teams mentioned. So that could be a possibility. He states that it is not certain that they are husband and wife. And then there's the other thing about this uh, passage um, that biblical scholars have debated on. Were Andronicus and Junia listed among the apostles? Because that, depending on how that Greek word was used, it could either mean well-known among the apostles or well-known to the apostles. It, depending on how that should be translated, that changes the meaning of the context of Andronicus and Junia, whether they were apostles or whether they were known to the apostles. So, again, I would just appeal to, if you're going to use this verse to to prove your point of saying there are female apostles, you're using a verse that's been highly debated and has questions looming all over it. And I also want to mention, uh, gotquestions.org talks about was Junia or Junius a female apostle. So I'll post that as well. And they mention about Dr. Daniel Wallace in here, about him doing extensive Greek uh, grammar research. And he says, in some, until further evidence is produced that counters the working hypothesis, we must conclude that Andronicus and Junia were not apostles, but were known to the apostles. So I'm going to post that link. But I mention that particular article because of this final clip that I'm going to play for you before we end today. Many of you are familiar with Mike Winger. Mike Winger is a continuationist, and he's had some uh, excellent teachings about the Passion Translation. He's been sounding the alarm about the Passion Translation for quite some time, done extensive work on it, and worked with other Bible scholars to look at it. And there's some other things. He's had some good content to cover. He's talked about the the concerns about Bethel. I was very I was very encouraged to hear about his video that came out a, a warning, heavy warning about the physics of heaven, which ended up that video uh, contributed to that book being pulled from the Bethel bookstore as it should have been years ago because it's a horrible book. And I have it. I have a copy of that book and it's a, it's an awful book, uh, very much new age teaching. At any rate, Mike Winger has been doing a women's series um, on uh, women in ministry. And he did a video about, um, about apostles. And there are some questions about other women that were uh, said to be apostles like Mary Magdalene and other things. But I wanted to talk about uh, and play a short clip for you about 45 minutes into this video. If you want to listen between 30 minutes to about 50 minutes, this kind of covers this topic in, in uh, more thoroughly because he goes into talking about the lexical meaning of the Greek word and syntax. And that's um, above my head. <laughs> <laughs> that's Greek to me, as my corny joke would be. I, that's a mom joke. But about 45 minutes in, he talks about this particular area. So I want to play this short clip for you, and I'll post the link again so you can listen for yourself and and really take this into consideration because this is a driving force that people are using for women apostles today. There are no women apostles that were apostles of Christ, and we need to be um, content in that and satisfied with that and doesn't mean that women are less than. We need to honor God's word and his order. So let me play this for you real quick so you can have something to think about regarding this matter. Any scholars scholars who are watching watching my series, I I do hope you'll look at Brewer's paper. I think it was well written. I think he brought tons of new data. And I think my conclusion is uh, Junie is probably not actually an apostle. She's probably well known to them. 
And um, if she was, then she's likely a missionary and she may have been focused on women's ministry. I say all this because um, it means that this sort of like egalitarian trump card, which is used all the time, it's used all the time. You know, the junior was an apostle, so how can you how can you possibly suggest that women shouldn't hold any and all leadership roles? That that trump card doesn't seem to work. It seems to be incorrect. It's based on very little information that could and seems likely to mean something different than what the egalitarians need it to mean. Because you need her to not just be any old kind of apostle. She's got to have a teaching authority over men as part of that role. And... Um, I don't think that we have reason to say that she does. So, so again, I will provide the link to the, in the description below for that video for Mike Winger, and you can check out uh, the the women's ministry aspect that he talks about. He's done a lot of work on that. It looks like, but I just wanted to play that for you and and give you some perspective from someone who is a continuationist and probably considers himself more of a, a milder charismatic, not in the camp of. New Apostolic Reformation. So that's why I said, and I've said before, not all charismatics are NAR. Now, I don't agree with everything Mike Winger says, but I do appreciate the, the work that he tries to do in being diligent on things and then trying to make corrections where necessary and wanting to truly be humble as a believer in Christ, uh, as we all should be in understanding what the scripture has to say on the matter and wanting to uphold the truth of scripture. So I hope that you found this episode helpful today and that you'll consider what has been said. And then you'll also consider the, um, the intent behind this and the, the, uh, the loving warning of this type of teaching, because this is an aberrant, this is a aberrant teaching. It's a dangerous teaching of saying that there are modern day apostles and prophets today with governing authority and then opening up the, this Pandora's box, if you will, of the governing authority and having extra biblical revelation. And essentially, if you don't listen to their revelation, then you are demonized. And and this is a story that's been told time and time again, uh, different people, same, um, same uh, plot line. A lot of times when, when I've talked to people and others have talked to them as well, coming out of this type of movement. And so we need to care about the word contending for the word of God matters, uh, fighting for the word of God matters as far as um, contending for the truth of it and standing on scripture and Christ crucified is sufficient in power. The gospel um, is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew and the Gentile. And it is the call of you shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith. And that is sufficient and that is powerful enough. And I think scripture is, it, it helps us to see that even if someone were to rise from the dead is what uh, Jesus talked about in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Even if someone were to rise from the dead, I would encourage you to go look at that. I think it's in Luke 16 and read that. But I think we can see in Scripture that it's not the signs and wonders and the miracles that draw people in the proper way. It's the preaching of the gospel. And the rising of Jesus Christ from the dead should be sufficient enough for any of us as believers as a miracle working sign and wonder to us. And to understand that God is still working today, that the Holy Spirit is still very much active and working today, and that we need to honor God's word in the truth that it's written and contend for it in, in the proper context because it matters. And when people begin to come along like Catherine Crick is doing, and I'm not going to call her an apostle because she's not. But when Catherine Creek comes along and others like her who are saying these these types of teachings and claiming these things and then ascribing additional meanings to scripture that do not say that all in the name of you need my anointing and my impartation so you can walk in power. And oh, by the way, be sure to give and give give your money with revelation because you need to be sacrificial because of what you received and, and have these different teachings taught, then then, then people that are professing Christians are being fleeced and they're being led astray and they're being deceived. And I don't have any problem, I'm not going to mince words in saying that because these teachings are aberrant, meaning that they lead away from Christ and they essentially lead into severe error. They lead away from the truth of the gospel. Please stay in the Bible and read it. Get in a biblically sound church. You are under apostolic teaching every time you read the New Testament, every time you read the Word of God. You're under, you're reading the more sure word of prophecy every time you read scripture, which true prophecy always is going to testify of Christ and point back to Christ and glorify Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. 
It's not about us getting some fancy word. And I can tell you, I have a journals full of many flowery f- words that were spoken over me that I thought I heard from God himself and the other leaders, well-known leaders spoke over me. I'm content with the word of God, which is the Bible. Again, I hope you found this helpful today. And I look forward to our time together as we look at another topic. And until that time, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.